This is past, this past December, Major William Booth and I had the honor of flying to Columbia, South Carolina to interview our first Eagle, Colonel retired Walter L. Watson, Jr. It was a wonderful experience getting to know Colonel Watson and learning about his childhood growing up in Columbia. He shared some fun stories, such as meeting his high school sweetheart, Joyce, who later became his wife. We also learned about Colonel Watson's college experience of working hard towards his degree in mechanical engineering. Colonel Watson graduated from Howard University and commissioned in the Air Force in 1971 as an avionics maintenance officer before later becoming a master navigator with over 3,100 hours in F-4s, F-111s, and the SR-71 aircraft. He had a very diverse and distinguished flying career in the Air Force and made history as the only African-American SR-71 crew member. He continued to have a great impact when he served as the commander and professor of aerospace studies at North Carolina a and State University. He also serves as, as the chief of the Air Force ROTC scholarship branch here at Maxwell Air Force Base, creating and executing one of the most powerful recruiting tools in Air Force ROTC history. The scholarship program he created, the Professional Officer Corps Incentive Scholarship, reversed adverse enrollment trends and saved millions in expenditures. Colonel Watson has received numerous awards throughout his career. In 2004, he was awarded the Brigadier General Noel F. Parrish Award, which is Tuskegee Airmen Incorporated's highest national award for service and impact. Colonel Watson is a true example of striving for your greatest ambitions, even when the odds are against you. So without further ado, please help me give a warm welcome to our first Eagle, Colonel Walter L. Watson, being, Watson Jr., being interviewed by my Gathering Eagles teammate, Major William Booth. Sir, thank you. It's a privilege to have you here, and it's an honor to have you here. Um, before we get started, um, why don't we go back to the beginning? Okay, we well. go back to the beginning. Um, before you became an Air Force officer, can you tell us a little bit about not only your childhood, but what inspired you to become an Air Force officer, sir? Well, uh, I grew up in Columbia, South Carolina. I was on the uh, footsteps of uh, Fort Jackson. And once I saw Fort Jackson, I kind of knew I didn't want to do that. Uh, uh, so I, I was kind of directed in another, another direction. I, uh, I saw a movie. I might have been about seven, maybe eight years old. And the movie was called The Hunters with Robert Mitchum and Robert Wagner. And they were flying F-86s. And I sat there with my friends and I said, man, guys actually get paid to do this. I said, I would pay to do that job. And they said, Walter, you're not. Well, they didn't call me Walter. They called me by my nickname. Because anybody who calls me Walter is selling me insurance. <laughs> but at uh, any rate, they said, you're not going to do that. Uh, that's not going to happen. Uh, and I thought, what do these guys know? Well, they knew a lot. Uh, Nikki alluded to uh, having some reading challenges uh, through the first six years of uh, elementary school. Uh, I was always behind in reading. I said, hey, this guy is, you know, probably the best thing he's going to do is press license plates. He's not going to, he's not going to do anything other than that, probably. But what they didn't know is I had a mother who was a second grade teacher. And she said, hey, what are you interested in? I said, man, I like airplanes and I like monsters. So I got all kinds of books about airplanes and monsters. And it kind of went back to that movie because I said, well, I want to build airplanes. So I started building models. I built all of the Century Series airplanes, F-100s, uh, F-105s, F-102s, F-106s. And that kind of caught me on fire. And uh, so my teachers said, well, we don't think you're going to be able to fly an airplane. Why don't you think about building airplanes? I said, well, that's aeronautical engineering. I think I can do that. I like science and math. And that's kind of where things went. Uh, I didn't realize that I had other deficiencies. I had not had a extensive flight physical. But one of the experiences I had was when I uh, traveled with my friends and we would go picking plums, my bag would be absolutely full from the bottom to the top. And uh, I would offer them to my friends and say, hey, I got more than you can have some. They said, no, nah, we don't want any of yours. So I would eat my plums and I would be instantly very sick. And uh, my uh, closest friend said, we don't know what's wrong with you, but all your plums are green. 
And that's when I started to figure out I had a problem. I'm colorblind. I could not see the right and yellow color of the plums. I was picking all the green ones. And I wonder why I kept getting them all, and they were picking from all the little ones in there. And I couldn't, I couldn't give them away. So uh, those, those two things alone started to make this big snowball wheel. Uh, one of the things that they also knew is I missed a couple of months of school as a first grader, and I had uh, a couple of eye operations. Now, I'm six years old, so I can't. Uh, being a pre-med person, you probably understand things like Salesians and all the ophthalmology. No, used to. You used to, yeah, this, but, this. but at any rate, they, they did those operations, which left me looking like a pirate for about two months because I had a patch on. And uh, they said, well, this guy's got eye operations, he's got reading issues, and he's colorblind. What cockpit he's going to get in, other than some experimental thing where they fire him out and he doesn't come back. <laughs> uh, but uh, that's kind of what happened as, as an elementary school person. Uh, uh, junior high was uh, being turned on by science projects, and I was in the science fairs. And uh, the most significant day throughout all that uh, elementary, junior high, and secondary school, the most significant day was around the 23rd of September of my sophomore year. I saw a girl. This girl attracted my attention, not by design. And man, I thought, this is, this is going to be great. Then I found out she would not have spit on me if I was on fire. <laughs> and I tried for a year. I told her all the things that I thought she needed to know about me. And she said, yeah, that's nice. Uh, you might want to spend your time doing something else. You know, Go find a yard to rake or something. You know, don't, don't waste your time with me. So I went around telling my friends that this was my girlfriend for a year. I went with her for a whole year. She did not know. I didn't have a telephone number. I didn't have an address. I barely had a first and last name. And uh, she, she stiff-armed me off for a year. So that's kind of taking all the way from you know, first grade up through uh, graduating from high school. That's great. Thanks for sharing that story. So um, obviously, we're well, the intro video and things we've talked about about the SR, mm -hmm. but that, that's a big gap of time, right? So if we go from the time where you were in high school to the SR, let's kind of bring it now down in the middle. Mm -hmm. um, I understood you flew the C-130. Yes. The F-4. Can you share some times before the SR about sure. your Air Force life? Sure. Uh, my, uh, my first assignment was to uh, Lowry Air Force Base. Now, most of the bases that I will mention are going to be closed. Uh, so I'm not that old, but most of them are closed. Uh, I went to Lowry Air Force Base as an avionics officer. And uh, I told the Air Force we had a thing at the time for those of us who are a little bit older. It was called a uh, Form 90. We call it a dream sheet, where you put down what you dream you'd like to do. So I told the Air Force I wanted to go west of the Mississippi and south of the southern Nebraska borderline. And the Air Force said, that's great. You're going to Grand Forks, North Dakota. <laughs> so I went to Grand Forks, North Dakota, which turned out to be a great assignment. I was a maintenance officer. We had two airplanes, two types of airplanes. We had uh, T-33s, which is basically an F-80 with uh, drop tanks on, on the tips of the wings. We had F-106, which was a very fast Delta Wing airplane. It could do almost uh, 1,600 knots. That's a kind of slow airplane. At any rate, uh, when I got there, uh, the squadron commander, Kenneth Olinger, said, well, Lieutenant, what are you going to do for us? And I said, well, sir, if you show me what kind of missiles you are firing and how uh, you want them to work, my job is to make sure that when you squeeze the trigger, it goes off and hits the target. He says, yep, that's what I want you to do. And my subtext was, in order to do that, I really need to fly in that F-106 over there. I need to get in the B-Mon. Yeah. I need to get in that T-33. And the squadron says, we'll fix him. We're going to put him in a T-33, and we're going to take him out over Devil's Lake and make him sick. <laughs> and I flew with a guy named Jordan Fitzhugh, and he went out, and he did barrel rolls, and he did loops. And then the next thing I heard up front was, Whoa! <laughs> And I said, Jordan, are you OK? He says, yeah, I think we're going to go back. So we went back, and he made himself sick. Uh, so they, they worked with me. We had a flight surgeon in the squadron. They asked me, uh, 
what flight school I wanted to go to. I said, well, what's the first one you can think of? I said, well, I'm going to NAV school. I said, okay, that sounds good. And uh, so I got an assignment to uh, Mather. Uh, I went to Mather with the intent of getting into an F-105 and, uh, or an F-4, but the 105 was the airplane I wanted to get into. Uh, I got a C-130 because it didn't have any F-105s in my class. I took a C-130 to Clark. Uh, it was a remote tour. It was 15 months. Uh, I got to Clark. It was about as cool as it is outside now. Uh, and my squadron, the first squadron I was in was an airlift squadron. A 776, I believe it was, Red Lions. Hadn't thought about that in about 40 years. Uh, but I learned a lot in that squadron. Most of the operations were out of uh, Utapau, Thailand, and Karat. And, uh, Nowadays, when aviators talk about electronic countermeasures, it's usually a switch yeah. or a knob that you turn. Well, in those days, it was not a switch or a knob. It was a person. And let me explain that. Uh, we had a mission that went into Phnom Penh, uh, Cambodia. And we would fly from Utapau mm -hmm. early in the morning. And we would come over Phnom Penh at about 18,000 feet. And the reason we started at 18,000 feet is they had a shoulder fire uh, infrared missile. It was called, we call them Strellas, SA-7s for the old heads. Uh, at any rate, uh, what happens was I'm a, I'm a relatively new lieutenant. I'm about maybe 24 years old. You know, I'm going to live forever. Yeah. You know, no missile they design can handle me. Uh, so we get to this 18,000 feet over the airfield in the C-130. And we're doing all of it, maybe 255 knots or so. And the guy says, OK, it's time to configure for countermeasures. Said, oh. So I'm looking around, and the load master comes to me, and he says, OK, here's your harness. I said, what's that got to do with me? He says, Lieutenant, you got to put your harness on. I said, harness, not parachute. He said, yes, harness. So he puts the harness on me, and he has this long lanyard, and he hooks the lanyard on the inside of the airplane. He says, okay, come on back here. And he, he depressurized the airplane and opened the door. He says, okay, here's what the deal is. You and I are electronic countermeasures. <laughs> We're gonna lean out of the door, starting at 18,000 feet, and if we see any SA-7s coming up at us, you're gonna fire your Barry pistol, your flare pistol, at the SA-7. <laughs> I said, this doesn't sound too good. <laughs> so, we start this descent. Now, mind you, I didn't tell you the guy that flies in the seat that you fly in, in the left seat, was maybe eight months older than me, oh, good. about 24, 25. The guy in the right seat was maybe six months younger than me. So all of the officers were under 27 years old. The load master was a million. Uh, the uh, the uh, flight engineer was two million years old. <laughs> so they had all the experience. They'd seen everything. So we start down. And it's early in the morning, and it had rained. And every time you make a bank and turn, the sun would glint off of the water puzzles that puddles down there. And you would think that that was a missile. So the low master fired. And I thought, what's he firing at? I don't see anything but a water puzzle. Well, as soon as he fired, that's when they fired. Oh. And then that's when I fired. <laughs> and then I said some words. And I think some people did some things in their underwear. And uh, we. Uh, Got on down and landed on the, on the uh, airfield there and taxied behind the revetment and unloaded. We were carrying uh, howitzers and all those kind of things that if you hit it, they would go boom. So it was going to be a short ride if we got hit. So uh, we unloaded the stuff there. And then I thought, OK, we got down that way. How are we getting back up? And the load master said, guess what? We get to switch harnesses. You're on the opposite side. So we did that back up again. They didn't fire at us on the way out, and we went back to back to uh, Utapau, and that was probably my first combat sortie. Uh, we had many after that. I was involved in the uh, evacuation of uh, Saigon, and I think I actually flew on the very last day of what's called the Vietnam era, and it's like uh, May 5th, May 6th of 1975, and the reason that's a designated date was that's the day we got the Maguez back. And uh, 
We got to see a lot of different things that way. You have, you have a bomb now called Moab. We had a thing called a Big Bertha. It was 15,000 pounds as opposed to 20,000 pounds, and we dropped it at the back of the 130 to make a landing zone to rescue the Marines that were there. So that was C-130 stuff. Uh, Air Force stuff is just as exciting. Uh, I, uh, I had some great leaders in Air Force. Uh, I flew Air Force first at Homestead. Uh, that's where I trained, and because I had been in 130 and had been in, in, uh, in a combat situation, they retained me at Homestead to set Zulu alert. Because the, the month before I got to Homestead, a, a guy defected out of Cuba, brought a big 21 down initial at Homestead, pitched out and landed at Homestead. So now we had to set Zulu alert at, at Homestead. Uh, but I left Homestead and went to uh, Bentwaters, mm -hmm. flying F4Ds there. And then I went to uh, Woodbridge, which is right across the street from Bentwaters. And then I went to Han, flying F4Es. And uh, I had some, met some great people all around. I mean, I, there, there are people in the audience I've known since 1971, uh, way before I was flying, and people I met at Han. Uh, I had some, some great leadership when I was at Han. Uh, I, I ran into a guy. I always teased him. Uh, I told him, his name is Leon Armour. I said, Leon, when you were a freshman in college, I was in the second grade. And he said, yes, that's true, Walter, but we're going to play racquetball, and I'm going to show you how experience beats youth. And he would beat me in racquetball 21-2, 21-3, and sometimes he would spot me 15 and beat me 21-16. <laughs> uh, but uh, he... Uh, he tried to keep us honest and tried to keep us with our wings because as a, a young captain flying F4s, you're you you know you're all forehead and no real thought. You just go out and as much speed you can get, you go do all kinds of things. Uh, but uh, I had a good experience at, at uh, Han. And then the Air Force said, hey, we'll give you any assignment you want. And I said, oh, that sounds good. Coming back from overseas, I said, well, I'd like to have an assignment uh, next to a major metropolitan area. And they said, well, uh, we got Luke. I said, well, that sounds pretty good. We got Las Vegas. And they said, we got this base in, in New Mexico. And I said, well, is, is it near a major metropolitan area? He said, well, it's not too far from, from Albuquerque. I said, well, that sounds great. I'd like to go there. So I took an assignment to Cannon Air Force Base. <laughs> and, and it is, it really is next to Albuquerque. But you have to have the wings all the way folded back at 72 degrees doing 600 knots. And you're only about maybe 12 minutes away. <laughs> Otherwise, it's about four hour drive. But uh, I flew F-111s there. I, I met a guy and flew with a guy. His name is, uh, uh, is it Gordon? Giddy? Got it? Gordon? Yeah, Gordon, I think. Gordon. Yeah. Gordon. Buffet? Yes. Oh, yeah, yeah, spell the same way. Yes, Gordon, Gordon Booth <laughs> was my next door neighbor and he was one of the guys on my flight. Uh, he had a, they tell me he had a little boy. He had a big head. Nobody likes him. Yeah, he had a big head. He had a big head. <laughs> uh, but uh, I flew 111s there. Uh, met a lot of guys who I would find out later, fly with later, uh, fly over later, uh, who did a lot of great work for this nation. Uh, the F-111, uh, yesterday one of the... Uh, Eaglets ask me, what's your favorite airplane? And my answer always back is, for what? You know, if you want to haul stuff, C-130. If you want to do air to air, F-4E. If you want to carry 2,000 pound bombs at night at 200 feet above the ground doing Mach 1.2, F-111. If you want to go face the enemy and look them in the eye with impunity and not have them be able to do anything about it but hold their ears, then the SR-71 is it. So each one of the airplanes has something special about it. Uh, but the 111 community is a, it was a very small community because we really only had like four bases, not counting Nellis, either uh, Cannon, Mountain Home, Upper Hayford, and Lake and Heath. That was about it. And uh, I had never done the back-to-back -back thing, i.e., if I was at Cannon, I didn't go to Lake and Heath back to Cannon and then to 12th Air Force or somebody. I never kept a job. I always changed going someplace, and that was hard on the family. Uh, my daughter had two states, 
three elementary schools in two countries in the first half of first grade. So she had to be extremely flexible, extremely flexible. But uh, that kind of brought me up to the SR-71. Yeah. It's a great transition. I Thank couldn't you. kind of scripted that better. Um, hey, so talk about now the SR. I, mm. When we had our interview, I thought mm. it was pretty interesting. We talked about the application process. This sure. is not your standard pilot qualification process. This is something different. Yes. Would you mind sharing with the audience uh, uh, what that's like? The way it came to me, I was in the, I was the stand, standardization evaluation, I whistle, uh, the, the Wing Director of Operations, Steve Pizak, came and said, hey, uh, we just got a message, uh, the SR program is looking for folks, and we have uh, three guys on base that they're looking for. We're looking for somebody who's got at least a thousand hours jet time, hopefully some combat time. Walter, would you be interested in, in applying? And I said, well, Colonel Pizak, let me, let me do some research and find out what's going on. Well, just so happened, that particular day I had an Air Force magazine on my desk and I was flipping through it, and I saw a guy named Bob Coates in it. And I had flown at Han, uh, F 4s with Bob Coates. So I said, let me call out there and talk to Bob. So I called Bob and said, hey, uh, Bob, uh, they asked me to, to apply, to ask me to consider applying for this program, because I was also considering applying for test NAB program. So Bob Coates said, hey, this is the greatest thing since sliced bread. Uh, if you want something here, you can get it. Uh, you know, if it looks like gold, it is gold. And I said, well, Bob, I think, I think I'll, I'll, I'll consider that. And then uh, he said, but don't take my word for it. Talk to Tom. Well, Tom was another guy who had been my roommate and F4 is uh, at uh, Zaragoza. So I called Tom up and I said, hey Tom, tell me about this interview process. And he said, well, uh, it's, it's, you can handle it. And I said, well, okay Tom, it's only gonna be what, a couple of hours, maybe, you know, like a regular flight physical, and, you know, talk to a couple of guys. He says, no, flight physical is three days. I said, three days? He said, yeah. I said, what can they do to you in three days? He said, well, you really don't wanna know right now. <laughs> So I said, okay, I'll do that. So I went out uh, to take the interview and I spent the first three days in the hospital. Now for those of you who would count, you have nine openings in your body. <laughs> and for those who have worn a pressure suit, I know that they put things in those openings that didn't fit. <laughs> uh, at least that's what they did to me. Uh, they did the little thing where they put the probes on your head and uh, the technician told me to relax and we just want to see where your brain waves are. And it was a cool day in Northern California. I didn't relax. I went comatose. I was asleep. And the person shook me and said, no, we don't want you to relax that much. So they, they did that and then they uh, did the uh, blood glucose tolerance test where you get the little bottle of what looks like Dr. Pepper that is basically 99% sugar. And then they take blood for the next three hours. You look like a junkie when you come out. I had to explain that when I got back to Beale, you know, that I had not turned over a new life. <laughs> uh, but uh, that, that was part of the process. They did that first before you did anything else to see if you passed the physical. And I, I passed the physical. Then came the simulator and what I would call stump the dummy. It's like you get in a cockpit you've never seen before. Uh, there are things that I had been, by that time I had been through five airplanes. I thought, well, it's not going to be anything you can show me in here other than a you know, cosmic laser or something like that I'd never seen. But you know, most of the stuff I recognized. And then when it got to the reconnaissance system stuff, I, I'd never taken a picture like that. I said, Don't do that, that kind of stuff. That's somebody else's thing. But uh, the biggest thing, that they were looking for is flexibility. How flexible are you? Uh, the third part of the interview, I think, and there's probably a couple of astronauts in here, I think there are fewer SR guys than there are astronauts. And as a result, we had to be able to get along with one another because a lot of things we were doing, the only people we could talk to was the ones in the group. And because we operated out of three locations, Beale, uh, 
Milden Hall and Kadena, often there's only four of us, so if there's something going on, we're going to talk to that group. So they want to see if you're compatible. So that was a week-long process. Uh, at the end of the process, uh, they don't give you an answer. They say, uh, go back to your base and, and do the best you can, and if you uh, change your mind about coming, let us know before we give you an answer. So I went, I went back to my base, and uh, unfortunately, when I went back to our base, we had to deploy, and I went to uh, Egypt. So I was gone for about a month and a half, and uh, I did not find out about being selected until I landed back at, uh, at Cannon. And that was a strange day, because when I landed at Cannon, my wife and daughter and son were out at the runway, and we were taxiing in, and I saw my wife, but I didn't know who that girl was that was with her, because she was taller than my wife. When I left, it seemed like she was shorter than my wife. And uh, when I got off the airplane, my wife came up to me, my daughter and my son came up to me, and the squadron commander came up and said, hey, Walt, congratulations, welcome back, but you're going to be leaving in a month and a half, go to the SR program. So that's, that's kind of ha how it happened. Yeah. Um, so then you joined the SR program. Um, I know you had a good amount of missions there, but would you mind sharing with the audience perhaps a, a memorable one or a one, perhaps your favorite? Uh, there, are, there are two areas that come to mind. I have a memorable one in, in Southeast Asia area, and of course I have one in the Middle East. Uh, if you have followed, a, uh, there's a series of books out, one called Sled Drive and one called The Untouchables. If you've read anything or know anything about those books, uh, my front seater and I flew uh, in El Dorado Canyon. El Dorado Canyon happened April 14, 15, 16th of 1986. And it was a, as a result of a bombing done by Libyan factors in, uh, in uh, Berlin. And President Reagan decided to make a statement to Muammar Gaddafi. And uh, Brian and I flew three consecutive days against Muammar Gaddafi. And I say that because, to our knowledge, there's not been another crew that's ever done three consecutive days. And what that really means, it doesn't mean you go out and fly. That means that what Brian and I had to do was prep the airplane for the primary airplane. They would take off. We'd get in our airplane, take off behind them. Very seldom do you have two SRs in the same airspace at the same time going in the same direction. That's, that's very rare. Uh, but that mission required a lot of coordination. There were so many tankers uh, because the French denied us the ability to go over their, their uh, territory. Not so bad for Brian and I, but terrible for F-111 guys who are cruising at 500 or 600 knots, at uh, 17, 1800 knots, okay. around, around Spain and we're there, you know, across the rock of Gibraltar and we can be in the Mediterranean in just minutes. But uh, Brian and I had been talking about, okay, what are we going to do when we get there? And we had had, uh, like, Nikki's folks, the intelligence folks, said, hey, here are all the missiles that, that are there. And uh, one of the intel guys said, but we don't think they're going to shoot. I think, where did this guy come from? We just dropped 2,000-pound bombs on him. You don't think they're going to shoot? Where did that come from? So uh, Brian and I uh, took off that morning. Uh, we hit a tanker just off of Land's End, and we accelerated to uh, Mach 3, we checking the airplane out, make sure it could do what it's supposed to do. And then we uh, let down over the Mediterranean. Uh, the typical SR-71 profile is you're at 80,000 feet, the tanker's down to 24,000 feet. He's going as fast as he can go, and we're going pretty fast at 80,000 feet. So we got to slow down from our best altitude down to not so good altitude, 24,000 feet. And now we're going as slow as we can go behind the tanker. So we are pulling up behind the tanker. And my job at that point is once is to get us behind the tanker, to rendezvous with the tanker. Uh, once we get there, then my job switches to being two things. One, fuel management, making sure that when we get to the end of the, end of the refueling track, we're full. And to cheer Brian on. Because I'm going to hear all kinds of, how long, well, how long, how many more minutes? And I always have to tell him in the convoy, you just got a little while yet. Just, Another 1,000 pounds, Brian. Another 500 pounds, Brian. Another two pounds, Brian. Okay, well, hold on a second, Brian. I got, I got to have some butterscotch pudding here. And I'd have a little butterscotch <laughs> pudding and 
get myself rehydrated, then I get back with Brian. But uh, <laughs> when we uh, got onto the tanker, you know, I'd heard some HF traffic. It wasn't really for me. But every time we pull up to the tanker and hook up, kick us off. What is this? Pull up, kick us off. And Brian says, well, what are you doing? I said, I'm not doing anything, man. I said, what are you doing? He said, we can't stay connected. So finally, the tanker gives us a code to go to their uh, HF frequency. And they had this urgent message for us. And I said, it's got to be something earth shaking. And the guy came on the radio and he said, hey, uh, uh, call sign blankety blank. Uh, be aware there's going to be missile activity and they're going to shoot at you. I said, boy, that guy's really smart. <laughs> He's really smart. I said, Brian, he, Brian said, what did he say? I said, they're going to shoot at us. He says, that's all? I said, that's all. He said, he said are we going? I said, yeah, we're going. Doesn't matter. We're going. So we, we pulled back onto the tank and filled up. And uh, Brian and I did our checks. And we started climbing to 80,000 feet and accelerating to Mach 3. And now Brian and I already knew that Mach 3 was going to be the slow limit. That was going to be the slow limit. And as we uh, approached Tripoli, you know, Momar and his boys gave us all the signals that, hey, we see you. And then the next signal was, we see you, we're looking at you. And then the next signal after that, we see you, we're looking at you, and here comes your birthday gift. And, <laughs> and I thought to myself, I said, this is my daughter's birthday. These clowns, there's something wrong with them. I said, Brian, Mach 3 is not going to be good enough for them. If we do Mach 3.2, 3.28, whatever it is, doesn't matter to me. Just as long as we can make that turn. And, and they tried to, tried to end our weekend. That, that didn't work. Uh, the, the sad part about that is below, uh, I lost two friends. One the guy across, across the desk from me uh, in Stan a guy named uh, Fernando Rivas. And he was killed along with Paul Lawrence. Those are the two guys who lost in that, that mission. The other mission was, was not as bad, but Brian and I did that uh, three times. And uh, it, it really made Brian and I a team, because I grunt, he knows exactly what I mean. He whines, I know what he means. Uh, but uh, Brian and I wanted to fly over to places that we had been uh, before. We flew over to a place where he had been shot down uh, several years before we flew over that place. And we flew over the place where we dropped a 15,000-pound bomb over the island of Cotain. And I could look down and still see the big spot where he had dropped it several years before. That was in Southeast Asia. We were going pretty fast there. The airplane, a lot of times people ask me, how fast can the airplane go? And most of the time, I'll say, well, very fast. And, and they say, well, were you looking at the speed? So yeah, we might have been looking at the speed. But if we were concentrating on defeating the missile, you know, the speed is good, but we're more concentrated on defeating that missile. Thanks for sharing that. You're welcome. Um, let's move on to now past your Air Force career. So um, the legacy that you've left behind, not only for the community here in Maxwell, uh, around the Maxwell area, the river region, has been significant. And so can we talk about some of the time that when you're here as, uh, working in ROTC, but also when you work with the Tuskegee Airmen mm -hmm. and you work with, with the kids in your local uh, okay. Okay. community in South Carolina? Um, my path to Maxwell was through uh, North Carolina A&T State University. They're known as Aggies, uh, not to be confused with the one out in Texas. Uh, but uh, North Carolina A&T is a uh, very distinguished, historically black university. Uh, they are known for their engineering school, among other things, engineering and accounting. Those are their two strong things. I was a PAS at that detachment, and the kids there, they were highly refreshing because most of them really wanted to be Air Force officers, and we had to jump a lot of hurdles to, to help them. And, and I was willing to, to do that because I said, hey, I was just like you, but it's been a few years, and I know the challenge of getting ready for the AFOQT, trying to pass a physical. Uh, my, my wife said, that I had a bias. And I have denied this for 30 years. She said, 
you had a bias toward the people who were in engineering. And I said, no, I didn't have a bias toward the people in engineering. I just told people, if you're in engineering, you are all right. <laughs> That's all I told them. But in all honesty, I would tell people, I said, you know, in the Air Force or any military organization, you know, your academic major might be important, but your leadership ability, your character, your integrity is going to be the most important thing people see. They won't see your diploma that says uh, uh, BS, uh, double E, M E, C E, I E, uh, E I E I O. Uh, but, but they will see your character, they will see your leadership. And sometimes they would say, well, I don't, I don't believe that. I said, well, I'll tell you what, uh, what's Colin Powell's academic major? And they would guess, well, he's an astrophysicist, or he's a nuclear research. I said, no, he's a genealogist. He studied rocks. You know? And he's not dumb as a rock. He studied rocks. But he's got great leadership skills. And that's what the military is looking for. Uh, we, we helped the kids to move there. I was very proud that. At that time, I had a discussion with a four-star, and we were trying to get black folks into aviation. And I said to him, I said, you know, we need to do something different. And he said, well, Walter, you know, I don't understand what you're saying. I said, well, sir, real simple. This is 1992. I said, 1992, you had the same number of black pilots as you had in 1942. Five. Lemuel Custis, DeBoe, Davis, Ross and Roberts, those were the first five. I said, you have five black second lieutenant pilots out here in the Air Force. In all of the 10,000 flyers, five black second lieutenants. And I said, you need to, we need to do something to encourage, to let the world know that we're, we're receptive. Because uh, the last time we had 1,000 black pilots was World War II. 996 Tuskegee Airmen. And that's when I started to learn a lot of them. I met B.O. Davis, I met Lee Archer, I met Roscoe Brown, the first, guy, first black guy to shoot down a jet in, in uh, combat. But when I left a and the things I'm most proud of are those guys and girls who graduated from a and and took a commission. Now I have to take some beatings about that because I have to bring this up. I don't mean any disparagement to Aggies. But I was trying to follow a biblical mode. And you send your very best to help the people who need the most help. So I told my wife, I said, I want my daughter to be an Aggie. I'm a Howard graduate. And the Aggies and Howard uh, are rivals. So we're going to send our very best to help the Aggies out. So we're going to send Alexandria to a and and have her help them out. Alexandria uh, went to a and She graduated with honors with a degree in industrial engineering. And she was the uh, detachment cadet commander. Now, she will tell you that I pulled a mafia deal on her. She said, Dad, I don't want to be an ROTC. And I said, OK, Alexandria, you don't have to be an ROTC. And she said, well, Dad, I want to live on campus. I said, oh, huh. we only lived about five miles from campus. So I said, Zanny, uh, you can live on campus if you try ROTC for one year. And she said, well, what if I don't do that? I said, well, your brother would be your roommate. <laughs> and she thought about it for about a nanosecond. And she said, I'll try ROTC. <laughs> and uh, she, she did well in ROTC. She, uh, she got an undergraduate degree in engineering and a master's degree in engineering from North Carolina a and And she was a diehard Aggie. Uh, to my chagrin, I have to keep reminding her, she was sent there in a biblical mode where you send your very best, help the people who need it the most. Uh, from a and they uh, offered me an opportunity to come to Maxwell to run the scholarship program. And at that time, it was very difficult to recruit. Uh, uh, this is prior to 9-11. The economy was booming. And everybody was watching L.A. Law, thinking that they were going to graduate from, high school, from college and move to L.A. and make six figures and dress nice and work for about 15 minutes a day and then be in the bars in the evening. And we kept telling them, eh, that's not kind of how it works. Uh, so when we came to Maxwell, my job was to find what kind of programs, what things we could do to enhance 
ROTC overall, and what kind of things could we do to help the eight HBUs that they had host units at? And uh, I said, well, in the fighter world, we had a term called dance with who brung you. And they said, well, what's that mean, Walter? I said, well, the kids who are going to be juniors have committed to being in your program. And those are the kids you need to invest your money in. So we came up with the POCI, the Professional Officer Course Incentive Scholarship. So we paid partial scholarships to those kids who were in their junior year of college. That helped a lot. The enrollment boomed for the people who were going to get, get commissioned. I did that for about a year and a half, and then I got to be director of operations. Uh, I had a, about 885 junior ROTC units from, from, well, they were all over the world. And then, of course, the operations for the uh, about 130 college units, about uh, 10,000 cadets across the nation. It was hard work because uh, it, it takes a hard, hard work because most people say, every general I met said, I need some more second lieutenants. And I said, yes, general, you do. And they said, well, but I can't afford to have field training here. I said, well, you know, that's, that's, that's tough. You know, last time I checked, you know, no disrespect, but I haven't seen the Air Force go out there and hire a general off the street. We grow them. So if you don't have a second lieutenant, you don't get to have a general. And uh, one of the generals looked at me like I was crazy. I said, well, I said yeah, I hadn't thought about it that way. I said, yeah, that's the way to go. Uh, he might have been an Aggie. At any rate, uh, 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 but at any rate, uh, I, uh, I had as much fun as I could do here at Maxwell. And then the, it became time to let somebody else have some of that fun. And uh, I had gone for an interview, and I had come back here. And a friend of mine called me and said, hey, do you know your high school uh, junior artist units coming open? Would you be interested in going? And I said, you bet. Now, what I told you back in the green room was how I got to Columbia, South Carolina. I had been interviewing in Washington, D.C., uh, Atlanta, and Durham. Uh, and I came home and told Joyce, I said, hey, I looked at a great house in Durham just outside of Duke University, and I looked at a great house up off of 66 in Washington, D.C., uh, and I was thinking about a house in Atlanta. And Joyce said, oh, those are great. Those are outstanding places. And she said, you can build that house in Washington, D.C. You can uh, contract that house in Durham, or you can uh, discuss that house in Atlanta, but you're going to be paying for a house in Columbia, South Carolina. <laughs> and I said, well, let me think about that a little bit. And I said, all right, I get it. My wife is a daddy's girl. I didn't, I didn't realize that. And uh, so we ended up moving back to Columbia, South Carolina. My, uh, my goal was always not to go to Columbia, South Carolina for a number of reasons. Primarily, my mother-in-law lived there. Uh, 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 and that was, that was the reason why I went to Southeast Asia. <laughs> uh, they, they, they offered me a job at Shaw, and I told the guy, uh, my mother-in-law house is 23.8 miles from Shaw Air Force Base. If you send me to Shaw, I'm going to wish I was dead every Sunday. But if you send me to Southeast Asia, they can only kill me once. <laughs> So, uh, but anyway, we moved back to Columbia, and uh, I went to my high school as a uh, uh, senior aerospace science instructor. That was almost as hard as combat. Uh, the high school had really changed, really changed. Uh, one of the teachers, uh, actually the assistant principal that hired me, I had known her since I was 14, and she called me by my nickname. And she only called me that. She used to call me Colonel Watson. She called me on the phone, and she called me by my nickname. I knew I was in trouble. She says, Colonel Watson, I need to talk to you. Well, oh, that's, that's administrative stuff. Maybe. But if she called me Skip, oh boy, it was, going to be, it was going to be a long talk where she was doing the talk and I was doing the listening. Because uh, I had known her for some, some years. But the kids there were really excited about being in the program. Uh, we went from having a daisy printer and one Apple computer to having about five laser printers and maybe seven or eight uh, Macs. I'm, no, we didn't have Macs. We had PS1s, uh, computers. The kids uh, started earning uh, scholarships because I convinced them not to wait until their 12th grade year to take the SAT. Uh, there are probably one, uh, at least one commissionee in this room 
perhaps, out of that program. There were five that went on to get commissions, uh, three in the Air Force and two in the Army out there somewhere. Uh, we, uh, we found out that the kids, I had a discussion with a general. Uh, his name was, uh, I think it's D.W. Deal. We had a discussion once. He said, uh, come by my office. I need to talk at you. So I said, I'll go by. Yes, sir. Went by his office, and he said, I need some feedback. I said, OK, what is it, sir? He says, uh, Tuskegee Airmen. Talk to me about Tuskegee Airmen, because we want to get some, some information out. Now, he had already had a fantastic program out. Uh, if you've probably seen the, uh, these uh, ads, marquees with the Tuskegee Airmen talking about the things they did, those are powerful ads. And I think that was his idea. And he asked me, he said, what impact would you think that make? I said, you know, once we tell the kids what it's about, it's going to make a tremendous impact. He said, what do you mean tell the kids about it? He said, don't we already do that? I said, we kind of, sort of. He said, you go talk to those ROTC guys, junior ROTC guys, and see if you can work something so we can get the information out to connect the ends. And we did. And I respect General Deal for that, because he didn't have to do that. That was a whole different reach out to, to make that happen. But the long story short of that, that directed me another way to get the word out. So uh, after some machinations trying to figure out something, we created a Tuskegee Airmen Award. Most of the awards for cadets are for seniors and juniors, no freshmen, sophomore. So we created an award for Tuskegee Airmen and it covers all uh, 986 units, no, 930 units at that time, over 100,000 cadets. And by this time, probably one and a half to two million cadets have been exposed to that. And that's all about leadership, perseverance, and integrity. Really, it's about the Air Force core values. You know? Integrity first, service for full self, excellence in all we do. That's, that's what that was about. And that work, made all the difference in the world. I did that for about a decade and a half. And I never was so busy in my life. My wife said, Lex, you didn't stop traveling. I said, well, you know, we live, the school is bounded by four major little roads, and most of the kids had never been out of the county. I said, you know, if you haven't seen a, an airplane, haven't been in an Air Force base, or haven't been in a museum, hadn't come here, and met a general, you know, you didn't know what it's like. And, and I made it happen. I said, I'm gonna take you places and I told the principal, I said, I'm going to get in your pocket. And he said, what do you mean? I said, you got $5,000? He said, not in my pocket. I said, but you got it in your budget. And uh, we would move it legally to transportation for cadets to go to the Tuskegee Airmen Convention. And I said, now, it's not going to just be kick back and have fun. You're going to do something when you get there. And they would present their awards, and the Tuskegee Airmen would support them, and they would be able to make an impact. Thanks for sharing that. This concludes the formal interview, so what we'd like to do now is we'd like to take about five to six minutes and open it up to questions uh, for, uh, for Colonel Watson. Yeah, go ahead, question, first question is in the back. Uh, Colonel Watson, I read that a previous Eagle was your front seater. What stories did he tell about you? Oh, geez. You, what stories are true or what stories did he make up? Now, Any story, sir. Any story. Well, fortunately, he is in the audience. He's over here to my right, and the best person to ask about that is Brian Shule himself. I think I have a, a story or two I would like to share at this moment. <laughs> Having just found out I flew with a man that was colorblind, I'm not too happy about that. <laughs> All the missiles are the same color. <laughs> Walter's a very humble man, and he would not tell you this story. And I thought of the many stories I could share with you today, all of which would embarrass the hell out of him. And I will forego those to tell you a story that I think sums up the real character of this man on stage right now. He told you a little bit about our Libya missions in 86, but the part of the story he did not tell you, I've always found most interesting. I witnessed history that day. We're sitting in the hangar, cranking the jet. The whole world is holding its breath. President Reagan has just bombed the hell out of them. People don't know if we're going to start a whole other war in the Middle East. 
And the SR-71 is going to fly over the line of death, over the Gulf of Sidra. Gaddafi said, I will shoot any airplane down. It penetrates our airspace. Here we are cranking, and we're pretty nervous. It's all calm out. Get every tanker in the world out there deployed. Now, Walter has a very sophisticated rear cockpit back there. We have a little R2-D2 navigation system back there that tracks stars in broad daylight. It's called an ANS, an astro inertial nav system. And it has an atomic clock. Those of you that are navigators here, you have an atomic clock to accurately fix your position at 90,000 feet at 2,100 knots, it's kind of handy. That clock is never wrong. And we're cranking. And I used to kid Walter on his kneeboard. He had three watches. He had like a little Casio thing, and he had like an Air Force watch, and then he had like a stopwatch. And I go, Walter, it's not an F4 now or somewhere. What are you, what are you doing? You got he goes, trust me, I have a system. And I had learned by then to trust this man because he did have a system and I didn't interfere with it. And we're halfway through the crank sequence and he said, the clock is wrong. And this had never happened in the history of the SR-71 program. And the commander's there in the hangar. We got all these Lockheed people there helping us. And the commander goes, what do you mean the clock is wrong? Clock can't be wrong. Never wrong, Walter says. It's off a few seconds. Commander looks at me like, uh, talk to him. <laughs> if Walt says it's off, it's off. He said, that's never happened. They took the, the whole world's holding its breath now. We're on hold. They take the R2-D2 out, put it on the bench. Six minutes later, they come back, said it was off. It was like six seconds off. I was in awe. <laughs> the commander. Looking at Walter like, you are a sky god. <laughs> how, to this day, I still don't understand how the three watches, sounded, but he had a system. Walter would never tell you that story. They saved that mission. We flew three times in three days, and we were very proud to be a part of that. It was little things like that, that a man who's committed to excellence knew his job. Imagine the guts it took at that moment against all odds and the entire face of the program to say, I'm, I feel certain it is off. I was always very, uh, held Walter in very high esteem, uh, more so than, than ever after that, that display of incredible uh, confidence. Walter, historically, will always be known as the first African-American guy to fly in this uh, program. I will always know him as the best backseater anybody could have ever had in the squadron. Uh, proud to salute you today, Walter. It's long overdue. And uh, thanks for flying with me. Thank you, Brian. <laughs>